Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Emmy Vadness, co-host with Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is word magic. My guest is Laurel Erica, who's a linguistic evolutionary and educational entertainer. She is the creator of Word Magic, a way of playing with words that helps people be kinder, wiser, and more literate. Laurel shows in verse and prose how young and old around the globe can collectively, creatively, and quite rapidly take command of the English language and upgrade it to facilitate our essential evolutionary leap from humankind to human kindness. Laurel is author of Horsing Around, The Inside Word on Marriage and Horses, Word Magic, Word Play That Puts a New Spin on the World, and The Book of E, a book of alphabet alchemy. Laurel is based in Santa Monica, California, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Laurel. It's such a joy to have you with us on New Thinking Aloud today. Thank you so much. I'm so delighted to play with you, Emmy. <laughs> For most people, words are just a way of simply communicating, but you found deeper meaning in them, and you even created word magic. Can you describe what that is? Well, my most recent succinct description, which I will elucidate after enunciating, is homegrown, grass-fed, synergistic, mystilinguisticism, self-awakening wordplay on beyond the leading edge. So to make that more clear, this is how I entertain myself throughout my life by playing with words, and they revealed all sorts of obvious yet overlooked wisdom and contradiction. And a lot of what I learned came about with a hit or two of cannabis. And as soon as I would be in an altered state, I'd start downloading things about the alphabet. And I assumed I must be a very primitive being to be so focused on something so basic as our ABCs. But then what I intuitively derived from these kinds of cosmic prompts was a whole different understanding, understanding of how the language echoes and reflects us. And people have noticed that in a couple of key words, which is disease as dis-ease, so self-defining, and history as his story, a bit of propaganda written by the winning side. And most people believe that these are unusual experiences of the language speaking for itself. And what I found is that it happens all the time. And so uh, playing with words has been a major source of my awakening experience. It really showed me that we are living in a matrix made out of words. And that as Terence McKenna has said, that if you know the words the world is made of, you can make of it whatever you want. How much of our words are communicated through the vibration or the meaning originally created for the word or the meaning of the speaker? A lot is going on, our body language as well. I've looked specifically at what words coexist, what different concepts are married together through their sound. And while that's called a homonym, and it's also referred to as a pun, and it's considered um, a joke and insignificant. And if you do make a joke of it, then people have been conditioned to groan about it. You know, oh, you've made a pun. What foolish fun that is. But 
feeling, <laughs> I've made sort of the joke. I mean, just about every word has a hum, has a, a sound twin, and even homonym has a fraternal sound twin, which is homonym. <laughs> which refers to human beings. And homonine is, if that's the correct pronunciation, is characteristic of humans, which wordplay is. And I grew up feeling like the lowest form of human because I was born into an environment that was not ready for an elemental being to incarnate in their midst. And I felt like the lowest form of humor and human, and so I gravitated toward puns, which have been considered the lowest form of humor, even though the greatest writers of English, uh, including Shakespeare and James Joyce, were master punsters. And the ancients, it turned out, were master punsters and recognized that as many meanings as you can load up into a single vibration, the more potency the word had. And playing with words was a way of cultivating literacy. But a lot of that ancient wisdom uh, and the idea that words could have a mind of their own and could echo and reflect us in ways that could inform us if we were simply to look and to listen. But there's so much dissuasion against looking at the obvious. And I mean, I was shocked to hear in a little video game that a four-year-old child was playing, a voice coming up saying, nothing going on over here, let's look elsewhere. Nothing going on over here, let's look elsewhere. Conditioning this young mind to overlook the obvious. And the difference between the obvious and oblivious is L-I, a lie. So I, feeling like an ignorant person, just having found a realm to play that others were disdaining. And I received a lot of opposition and ridicule along the way. But I had no choice because I, it was compulsive in me to look at words in this way. And I have double hearing. Some people have double vision. I have double hearing. I, words always um, split in a sense in my mind where I hear the intended meaning and I hear the uh, subliminal message that can, is carried on that vibration. And so my work became known uh, widely when someone posted the secret spells of the English language, which I recorded and posted on YouTube in 2010. She posted it on a popular website and it immediately went viral. And look at how often we've looked at going viral as the um, essence of success on the internet. And then the whole world went viral. And so obviously that's a word that needs to be tuned up. And sometimes I call it going spiral. And in the Word Magic Global Anthem that I also posted at 20, in 2010, which is called uh, Taking Command of the English Language, I describe the word tourbillionaire and tourbillion, which means something resembling a whirlwind or a firework that rises spirally. And, and then go on to say, we all could be tourbillionaires with whirls of words that swirl the world's next revolution. And it's a really powerful piece. And it gives the solution to the problem that the secret spells makes clear to people, which is that our language is loaded with subliminal, contradictory messages that must affect us subliminally. So good morning, uh, for instance, morning, of course, is grief. 
and a wake is a funeral party for the dead. And if you just look at my original 2010 video, you can see a lot of examples of this earning the living and weekdays and have a good weekend. We are articulating repeatedly messages that evoke a very dark vision of the nature of reality. And a lot of people over the years have asked me, who did this to us? And no doubt, to some degree, it was done to us. <laughs> but I think there's also, uh, and, and we see the language constantly being changed. Orwell wrote of it um, in, was it Animal Farm? And about people picking words out of the dictionary, words that can enhance our sense of human possibility. And I am about to do a series on my YouTube channel uh, about a dictionary of higher possibilities. Some of the words I've found over time that give us an understanding of what we are capable of as human beings. And what has happened in the culture has been such widespread degradation of language, misuse of it, um, erroneous kinds of definitions. And look at the word definition. We are deafened to our definitions. And we talk about what a word means, and mean means a whole lot of things we don't want to mean when we're talking about words like cruel and shabby and average. And so who I think did this to us is us. And the vision that I have collectively is that when English was uh, a molten streams of consciousness flowing into one um, river of thought and sound that the dominant cultural influence was the church, which was a very manipulated theology intended to gain control over people's minds. And so um, that kind of energy imprinted on this molten stream of consciousness is echoed and reflected in the language so that sometimes in speaking English, it's like I feel like I'm walking through a mind field because there's all these double messages in words. And so many of them are negative. Like um, in my language of the birds, I give some examples. And, the, and I also have a piece called... Um, proposing changes to our terms of agreement. It's unfinished, but I have at least a page up probably on my website. But pointing out that atmosphere sounds like at most fear. And when we are at the greatest degree of fear, we are most out of touch with our connection to the infinite because we're operating, as we know, in the amygdala, the fight, flight, or freeze part of the brain geared to protect us. So if you can have people through your use of language, through your redefinitions of common, ordinary words where we thought we had agreement about their meaning, then they're in a state of being very malleable and very um, willing to surrender their uh, self-sovereignty to an outer authority that purports to have their best interests in mind and to offer them um, satisfaction and safety for their compliance with an agenda. So I think because this kind of manipulation has been going on for millennia, that words were influenced by it. They echo and reflect cultural consciousness as well as our innate wisdom as humans. And for a long time, I was simply finding these negative words and the ones with double messages that are very negative. And I heard within myself, do you want to show off your cleverness by revealing the mis mixed metaphors of cultural dysfunction? Or would you like to 
look for the more positive words, and I really didn't think there were any, um, and I've found plenty. And um, can I always call them to mind in an instant? Not necessarily, so I usually share the ones I have shared before, but it, it really does happen all the time. It's really quite beautiful, and for instance, um, the infinite, where is the infinite? God is out there, I am right here, and yet the word infinite shows that the infinite is infinite. So it's in the source field. Nothing can exist and take form that isn't made of the same energy. And when I was 20 and I read um, in the book, the Phenomenon of Man by Teilhard de Chardin. It stuck with me all these years, and it was, if there wasn't the impulse toward union between molecules and cells, then love couldn't appear between us in harmonized form. So love is the energy of synthesis throughout the universe, not hate, not conflict, not competition, but love. And the fact that love is turned around the beginning of evolution, it does take that that energy. Uh, I mean, another way of denigrating some of the language, using the word, for instance, fuck, and using it as a curse word, and using the word Jesus and Christ, the quote, Prince of Peace, as another kind of curse word. I mean, we have it so backward. And when I wrote my fairyography called The Rites of Passion of Philomela Nightingale, A Fairy's Tale, a phrase occurred to me early on, which was, I was born in upside down town to the king and queen of backward land. I spoke a foreign language, which they had to twist to understand. The king was sowing sorrow and the queen was reaping grief. I held my dreams, but lost my way, confused beyond belief. How ossified the king in patriarchal misconceptions and how brilliant was the queen in monumental self-deceptions. And I wish that I could say that they were singular exceptions, but they were the rule, as I know you'll confirm with your reflections. And it's a very long piece. I'm going to start publishing, um, illustra having illustrated and published certain of the poems within it. So this idea that we are living in an upside down reality, when my friend Jeffrey Armstrong, who is a Vedic scholar and astrologer and Sanskritist, when he told me that Sanskrit has, he said at the time, 52 letters to the alphabet. I think some of them are, are maybe 50 with accents on a couple of up the others. I don't know. But when he said it was double what we have, I thought this is how we got ran head on into the looking glass and got trapped there. We are in a mirror world that reflects the truth in opposition. So we die for peace. We kill for peace. We die for a good time. We're entertained by crime. There's so many backward, upside down and backward values. And so in my poem, Ipsissima Verba, which is in this book, word magic, word play that puts a new spin on the world, I, I share some, the ultimate backward, which is the word dogma. I looked at it once and I thought, wow, dogma, any metaphysical philosophy, if you don't understand it, is dogma. And when you do understand it, it's unnecessary. And I just turned the word around and I thought, oh, am God. 
when we know we are the divine, the infinite, infinite form, then it's more possible to, and more credible, to believe that we have supernatural capacities. And Dr. Joe Dispenza has found the formula that's allowing so many people all over the world to have spontaneous remissions of incurable conditions and to access mystical, mystical states of consciousness where higher knowledge and wisdom is just downloading. And it's without any psychedelics. It's just sitting and meditating. So we have capacities beyond our um, current ability to understand and the Sanskrit language, which I'm just beginning to um, discover more about, the Sanskrit language, the word for the Sanskrit alphabet, the Sanskrit term for it is um, the, the, the house of the devas. These are vibrations that directly address the higher energies we are seeking to align ourselves with. And Jeffrey Armstrong is putting together some new books that will be introducing more Sanskrit into English and decolonizing the Sanskrit language. And so our work is on parallel tracks. He is about introducing more of this language and I am about inspiring people to tune in to the still small voice and download new symbols, sounds, words, metaphors, and phrases that can convey a higher frequency of consciousness in our communications and inspire a greater frequency of kindness in our interactions. And ancient India was a culture, as I understand it, that was all about self-actualization. So it has the language to articulate it. We do not as yet, and therefore can hardly conceive of our possibility to live as the divine in human form and bring forth a culture that is healing and uplifting and supportive of countless people. So. I'm about to launch my word magic literary lotto. Um, if people will, would like to subscribe on my website, wordmagicglobal.com, you'll receive the announcement when the literary lotto will go live and you'll have an opportunity to send in your words and phrases to tune English to um, a more delightful, beautiful, musical, form of communication that is healing as we speak and write. Well, what are we to do? You know, even having a conversation with you here today, it makes me think of the words that I'm choosing that my intention might be different than some of those parallels you've been able to draw on some of the words that we use. How do we go forward without you know being in the landmine, as you say? Well, that brings up your original question, how much is, you know, uh, intention, how much is the sound of the word itself, the vibration? I certainly don't know the proportions, but I do know that I am not perfect at speaking only the highest and best words possible, but I do hold the highest and best ten intention that, that every encounter is one that is healing and a, a blessing to others. There used to be, and maybe there still are, people who are described as grammar Nazis looking always for the correct pronunciation. And now there's been such a shift in the language that I don't know that they have much traction anymore. And uh, now there's something that looks kind of like a word magic Nazi. Some guy who corrected me for using the word bless because he saw in it be less and others have seen that too. What I see is that most of us feel like lesser beings. We feel um, out when we are not in our wholeness, we do feel out of balance and 
often inferior to others, but when we are in our being, when we are, when we are in the seat of being, which means that we have possession of this instrument instead of the mind chatter running away with all sorts of wild and terrifying ideas, then we do have the capacity to bless other people and to be a blessing in the world. And when the mind is quiet, then the heart opens. So people feeling like the word bless has be less in it. And I've, I've heard this from several people, and then it becomes a rule. This is what this means. And I have to say that all my work is intuitive and speculative. And when I started looking at these double meanings in words like awake and mourning, it was all supposition on my part. But when it finally led me to the recognition that language is software and English is the leading software of the Western mind and we can collectively, creatively upgrade it to support our own evolution in consciousness, it was after that that I learned that Confucius said, if given charge of the governance of a country, the first thing he would do would be to correct the language. And Orwell himself has said politics corrupts language, and language once corrupted has corrupting real-world influence. And I have quotes as well from McKenna and Gary Zukoff, many others, and including Greg Braden, that demonstrates that the language we are speaking is made up of words that are uh, debilitating energetically, confusing consciously, and that we can upgrade it collectively. I will be launching my literary lotto with the intention of making it possible for people to share the insights they receive when they are listening to the still small voice and asking to be informed. And so some words need to be tuned up. And a perfect example of that is when I asked a group of people, what shall we do about the word hello? So there's many who have recognized that the language um, needs to be evolved. And my idea is that we are the ones to evolve it collectively and creatively. And I read in a book by the grandson of Charles Berlitz, who founded the language schools, a man made a bet over drinks in a pub in Ireland that he could invent a new word and have it in circulation in 24 hours. And so the next day there was graffiti in many places and the word posted was quiz. And he won the bet. And that, I believe, was in the 18th century. And so we now have the internet. We can create beautiful words. And I am all about speaking beauty. There's a lot of verbal invention going on right now. And dictionaries are just scooping it up without much discrimination. And my discrimination is, does this sound and sense sing to my heart? Does it inspire my mind? Does it lift my spirits? And that's what I look for in beautiful words and in, in verbal inventions. And so one of my words that follows on from that statement that I quoted from Teilhard de Chardin about love being the energy of synthesis in the cosmos, the word that occurred to me is glucose, which is the sweetness of the love energy that binds us together. And in taking command of the English language, my word magic anthem, I give the example of um, commit random acts of kindness and acts of senseless beauty. 
And I looked it up online and it, it purportedly began with a woman in a coffee shop in Northern California. It was just a divine download that she then shared and it changed behavior around the world. And to be the one who releases the dove of peace on a wave of love that lifts us all above our usual sense of separation must surely be the cause of an ongoing celebration, yet is certainly an experience that lifts us well beyond words and beyond anything money could possibly buy. And yet it is free for all who wish to glorify the divine's living presence is our human essence and thus to bless the best in the rest of us. So that's just a little piece of taking command of the English language. And I'm all about having fun and love, kindness, and beauty feel a whole lot better in the body than trash talk and meanness, which may project negativity at someone else, but we being the source of that are bound to feel it and experience it. And everything we do, especially the things that, that people do, you feel they need a lot of money in order to be able to afford to do. It's all about the feeling it will engender, or we assume that it will. When we realize we can self-source all of those feelings through loving kindness to ourselves and others. I mean, we become uh, generators of a higher frequency of consciousness in ourself and other people that out pictures in our everyday experience. Well, I think most of us are fans of love and beauty. At the same time, do we need words in our languages to help us express some of what we might consider negativity. Absolutely, but to do it with consciousness and addressing ideas rather than accusing people. A lot of the ideas that have gained traction because of memes, slogans, and sayings that may be um, fun to repeat and people may do so with a lot of, of vehemence, a lot of uh, emphasis and anger, and it creates nothing but more of the same. It does not create resolution around issues. So being able to understand the issues that you're, you're marching for or protesting about for instance, right to life. Well, we all believe that we all deserve the right to life, but quality of life makes an enormous difference. And condemning a woman to bring a fertilized egg to full term, even if it came through a rape, even if she has no means to help cultivate a new human being to be a fulfillment of their greatest capabilities and offering no support to her during pregnancy or afterwards to do so, is this the right to life? Or is this trying to control the means of production of human beings? So understanding a a subject matter deeply instead of becoming part of the army that carries an idea aggressively, uh, even if the idea is a lie and you don't know it, and there's so much deception going on. Um, it's just fake news, etc. all of this sort of misinformation, disinformation. If someone could distinguish for me the difference between that and a lie, I would be very happy to understand it. And then censorship, I mean, it's crazy right now. And each person is really on their own to find sources that they trust and then 
to investigate beyond the fact that this person said it or that person, instead of becoming the arms, legs, and mouthpiece of a poorly understood idea. So yes, of course, we need language to be able to communicate fully, and we need the vocabulary to do it, and we need the willingness to speak truly and clearly about ideas instead of denigrating people who hold ideas we oppose. Yeah, absolutely. How can we each level up our words to go to a higher vibration since it, sure, there are other mm, others who throughout history have oppressed quote us or certain people have oppressed others and we within ourselves can oppress ourselves, oppress ourselves. So how can we level up our own language? And I'm also thinking of some of your wordplay that might help us in that regard. I think intention is like the rudder that um, helps direct us on the sea of consciousness and the intention to, to be our very best self and to inspire the best instead of the beast in others is a um, beautiful intention. And then words come. Um, we encounter them. I've encountered so many words, just the word of the day on dictionary.com or old dictionaries, I think are far more valuable than new ones because they were written for a, a more educated audience than today. And they haven't been as manipulated to the degree that they are. So playing dictionary div divination, <laughs> find an old dictionary at a used bookstore and um, just hold a question in your mind and open it at random and just look for um, and just let your finger go down the page with your eyes closed and stop somewhere. Learn a, let, wor learn a word. English is losing so many beautiful, valuable words, and we can bring them back. And I offer a lot and will be doing much more so in the times ahead on my YouTube channel, some of my favorite obscure words. And for instance, um, the word anamnesis that I encountered by chance in a dictionary, that means the soul's recollection of what it knew from a prior lifetime. And that's the first definition. The second one is uh, a patient's recounting of their medical history. So that is an example of a beautiful word that lets us know that you have more knowledge than you know of. Whether you believe that you've lived and been here before or elsewhere or not, you have so much more. We all do. That is, we've heard that we use only a small percentage of our brains. So what is in that larger percentage that we can access and make use of today? And just envisioning these possibilities and asking inwardly and uh, I guess the favorite word that I got just by asking my invisible friends to give me a new word was the word, the, the true meaning of beautiful, which is be you to full. Be your fullest, most authentic expression. And once I was looking at the word eccentric, and I thought, what's the eck that I'm supposed to be centered on if I'm an oddball? And then a few days later, I'm reading by chance through a New Yorker magazine, I see the word echt, E-C-H-T, a German word that means real, actual, and authentic. So I saw eccentric is really about being eccentric, centered on our whole self. So we have invisible allies. and. That can be hard for many to believe because we have only believed our senses, even though our senses are frequently deceived. Now, so I read a book, I forget the name of the author, called Angels in My Hair, and 
a woman, an Irish woman who was Lorna seeing- Byrne. I think I'll be interviewing her soon. I look forward to hearing it. She is such a reminder that we are never alone. And um, the divine, when we come through, doesn't expect us to make our way through this hall of mirrors on our own. Uh, we are uh, given angels and guides, and they will work with us when we request it. And so ask, give me a new word or teach me a new word. Or how could I, at the end of the day, thinking of our interactions with people, how could I have said that differently in a way that would have conveyed more of my heart and less of my upset feelings in the moment? And and just do that on a daily basis and you start honing the instrument that you are. And and the idea of the language, the swearing. I mean, people are free to use, of course, whatever words they want and and to be abusive in their language. But again, um, it all comes back. It, It affects us energetically as well as the other person and a, an accumulation of this negativity um, undermines our health and well-being. So setting the intention, asking for um, divine angelic assistance, looking in old dictionaries, listening to um, podcasts and YouTube videos that might use language that is unfamiliar to you, looking it up, knowing that the definition changes depending on the author of the dictionary and the time in which it was written. Um, which brings up a subject for me. There's a lot of, there's a word, psychurgy, that years ago I read and it means mental energy. I've looked it up more recently. I can't find it. And I didn't, and I think I may have found it, but a different definition. So that to me is a really important concept, this idea of mental energy. And of course, Jeffrey Mishlov wrote of the PK Man, um, a book that is fascinating to read about someone who had Uh, an incredible degree of psychokinesis and could affect um, people and places and atmospheric events and UFOs with the power of his mind. So we all have power in our mental energy, but it gets so distracted by all of the electronic devices that it gets fragmented and ADD and procrastination become more prevalent. So that amazing power to focus energy individually and then collectively on a higher vision of reality gets dissipated. Yet it's part of something all of us have. And when we have the intention to affirm what we desire to experience and to manifest our vision, it's important to really practice mindfulness, hearing the mind chatter and letting it go, hearing the negative words that come out of our mouths and taking them back. Do a retake if you're in conversation with someone and say, I don't like how that sounded. It doesn't really represent how I'm feeling except for that level of anger that got sparked in the moment. But, I mean, play with it. Language is so powerful. It has so much impact. It's not only the Genesis myth of this culture that says it all began with the word. It's cultures east and west, industrial and indigenous, go back to sound as the originating spark of creation. And so we are creating as we speak and write. And if you want your life to feel good, if you want it to be a manifestation of your vision instead of our collective nightmare, then be conscious of the language. Do things to um, expand your 
knowledge base of words. It's fun. Word play is a lot of fun. Play with words. Turn them in. I call it insight out and backward. And by the way, speaking of backwards, and I shared the word dogma, which I consider the ultimate backward. I read in uh, the introduction to a book called The Way of Weird, Tales of an Anglo-Saxon Sorcerer by Brian Bates many years ago. In the introduction of the edition I had was a quote by uh, Fred, Dr. Fred Wolf. And he said that when the Christians came to power, everything meaningful to the Anglo-Saxon was reversed 180 degrees. And when I read that, I thought, backward land. And he said, this affects everything, including the English language you speak today. So English is the the love. The, the leading software of the Western mind, and it turns out to be the language of the birds, according to the historian mythologist William Henry, who has a book by that name. And we can evolve it so we're not squawking at each other. We're not cawing at each other, but we're speaking in ways that promote health and wholeness. And it's a, an insight job that we can do creatively and collectively. Can you share a little bit more about wordplay? For example, what is alphabet alchemy? That's looking at the alphabet not as meaningless symbols for meaningless sounds, but as significant emblems that represent something to the unconscious mind. And we've discussed uh, culturally that symbols are the language of the unconscious and yet have been unconscious to the most prevalent set of symbols on the planet. So when I was about five or six, I wondered who said A, B, C, D. But And I I sort of had an image of my mind of these letters being found like shells along the sea of consciousness. But of course, they each have a history. And there have been people who have looked at the esoteric alphabet. Most of my work um, is intuitively uh, derived and designed. And at the time that I wrote my poem on the letter S called Esoterica by Laurel Erica, the definitive exegesis on the letter S in verse, I was friends with Dr. Leonard Schlein, who was a medical doctor, a surgeon, who had already written Art and Physics, which became a bestseller, and at the time was writing The Alphabet Versus the Goddess. So I got to read it in manuscript form, and I think he was the first one who heard my poem, Esoterica. So I don't know, I don't know how metaphysical he was in per his perspective, but I see in these power, the power of these sort of alphabetic symbols, and there are esoteric meanings that people have divined in them, and I have myself in a few of the letters. So it's playing with the symbols of the alphabet in ways that elucidate a deeper meaning in them. And when I was a child, I thought elemento was a single letter of the alphabet. And as a website was fully, I, I don't like using the word grown because it sounds like a unhappy cry, and I don't like to call myself an adult because adult is an idiot. So those are words that need to be tuned up, which reminds me in terms of tuning the language. When I asked people, a group of people quite a while back, what shall we do about the word hello, the reverse of which is oh hell, this woman who was a midwife said, how about hallow? And who knows better about 
hallowing, about recognizing and honoring as sacred as someone who welcomes new life into the world. So as a child, I thought Elemento was uh, a single letter of the alphabet. When I had uh, more years on me, <laughs> on earth, I, I realized in a sense it is. It's a word. Elemento is elemental, and the alphabet is elemental. So then I had to wonder, well, what's elemental about the letter P? And I looked it up in a book of um, the um, esoteric alphabet, and P is a symbol of the mouth, and it was in the mouth of Krishna that his mother saw the world or saw the universe, and we have the world in our mouth. The world derives from the word, and you can see it just by looking at those those two words. and. So, so P, the world, our ability to speak is an elemental gift. And I started looking at the word and the world as a teenager. And I, I thought, I wrote down in the beginning, there was the word. And then I just added an L to word and it automatically became the world. And I thought, wow, that's powerful. And then I looked at, since the word is God, according to the Bible, I looked at the word God, and I added the L, and God became gold, which many people have worshipped as God on earth, which is why we have simply unearthed the very ground of our being in search for precious metals that can grant us the power to dominate the world. But metal has, there's four words in the word, in the sound metal. There's the mineral metal. <laughs> there are the metals that are made out of, um, you know, as ins insignias for bravery in the battlefield and Nobel Prizes, etc. Then there's uh, metal, M-E-D-D-L-E, -E, which is to interfere with other people. And then there's M-E-T-T-L-E, -E, metal, which is a quality of mind and the capacity to meet challenges with grace. And so the most precious metal is our, the quality of our consciousness and the idea of changing um base metal from lead to gold, that is an alchemical transformational process for um, elevating our level of consciousness so that we are speaking and acting in ways that are noble, which is noble. They are based on integrity that we we do not sacrifice our integrity for any gain because that gain is illusory. It is temporary and it does not confer the quality of joy that we are seeking to live. So I have this, uh, the start. Well, I have a, a poem that's called Rearranging the Vowels in poetical order, uh, which I'll post maybe on YouTube soon, because A-E-I-O-U, A-E, uh, is part of a word, which is A-E-A-E-A-E, -E -E, which I found in Peter Bowler's book, uh, A Superior Person's Book of Words, something like that. And it means magical arts, and it also is the name of the island which um, Circe, the, um, the, the, whatever you call it, sorceress, um, lived on. So taking a bit of magic, A-E, in front of I-O-U, creates, I mean, it's cosmically correct, but it's financially impoverishing. So when you take A-E in front of O-U-I, O-U-I is we in French. It means yes. And 
It's also um, A-Y-E, the sound of agreement. And it is we in French, we, not just me, which is an upside down we. So, and then if you look at our eyes, it's E-Y-E-S. We have yes in our eyes. And I look at that as that we are meant to see for ourselves and say yes to life. And another word for yes is I, A-Y-E, and S-I in Spanish. And then we have no in our nose. And so yes in our eyes, no in our nose. Wisdom requires discernment and good sense. Out in our mouth, in in our chin. So it's playing with words and words within words to see what wisdom they hold because Again, they cannot but hold a message because each unit of each symbol and sound has potent energy to cast spells or enlighten and awaken. So how can we let go and enjoy our lives to be ecstatic? Well, I have a little, very short poem on that. Uh, which is that we we have a cellular line to the divine, but ego causes static. As we each let go and enjoy the flow, our lives become ecstatic. So I believe joy is our natural condition. And if you look at a happy young child in a healthy environment, you see that there are... (laughs) Great moments of joy, creativity, lovingness, playfulness, and then anger and unhappiness, etc. But it's like they flow through it so quickly if given the opportunity and no one's coming in to try and fix what they themselves can solve. And so that I, I believed myself when I was growing up to be irreparably damaged by the kind of experiences I had. And then when I was introduced to Sid Banks, Three Principles, S-Y-D Banks, um, I came to realize that the only thing between me and my natural innate state of joy is a lot of mind chatter. And then the tendency to identify with the thoughts and have emotional reactions to them, which then snowball and then have, you know, might precipitate my speaking mindlessly and cruelly to others trying to discharge the anger. Yet all I need to do is find that quiet within myself by whatever means I can do that, listening to music, dancing, writing, going for a walk, all sorts of things so that 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 sense of frothing with upset quiets and when it does, the heart opens and the wisdom happens. And then that joy, that natural condition and the uh, and the beauty of being has the control of the instrument in those moments. And I think we go back and forth until we get to a place where we shift into a steady state of equanimity, where we can look at the thoughts, not all of which are our own, and the the static on the line without identifying it and without losing our seat in being because of it. So it's an evolutionary process, or at least it has been for me. What is the relationship between eros and generosity? So I did find the word eros in generosity. And in the word misery is miser. So I believe we are a collective being. And our eyes face outward so I can see you and you can see me. And we need each other to reflect ourselves, each other or a mirror. And I believe it's because we really are one being like ourselves, ourselves, of an oversoul. So if I allow myself to 
share from the overflow in my life, not only does it create a blessing for someone else, but inside myself, I feel the love. And evidently, altruism uh, affects the same part of the brain as cocaine. So I talk about the pleasure of sharing and have a, the possibility, well, there's this little silly joke about what's a four-letter word for intercourse that ends with a K, and the word is talk. And so it's possible through our speech to be generous with our words, generous with our praise. I really enjoy meeting someone for the first time, maybe in the elevator, uh, just even casually. And if there's something about them that touches my heart, then reflecting that to them. And so I get to have intercourse in ways with uh, perfect strangers that lift our spirits. So it's generosity of spirit. It can be generosity of of um, money, it's so much fun to share. And so I realized when I was thinking about this, I felt like a character from Winnie the Pooh that I know where the honey pot is. And it isn't the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. It's the, the love and kindness that I can share with complete strangers that this generosity of being expands my heart and my joy in the world. And what we convey, the word smile has mile in it. A simple smile across a crowded room, people can carry that for miles and transmit it to other people. And I, I realized that Freud who said that everything centered on the pleasure principle and he centered that on the, you know, the anatomy, (laughs) our orifices. Um, I, I realized that it's correct. It's just he stopped too soon. And as we refine our energy, the pleasure becomes more and more exquisite. And so it's possible to feel this exquisite connection with other people through what Dr. Joe Dispenza calls the generous, pres- uh, the precious, the generous, precious moment, the now. If we are in the now and in our heart, or it's our intention to be, spend as much time out of the mind and in the heart, then we give in such a way that stimulates pleasure in others as well as in ourselves. So I invented a word for this kind of pleasure, and it is meta-transensuous suprasexual parahedonism. And the tagline for it is accept nothing less. And I just, as you might hear, combined all these prefixes about above, 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 and It's possible to live above the noise and the chaos of this world. If we tune out the the news where we can and tune into the beauty of the heart, and I do believe, as many others do, that there's more and more cosmic energy seeking to help humanity awaken to a higher frequency, which is where we experience the joy more often. So misery, on the other hand, is being a miser. Just drop the why or take the why out of misery and ask yourself, why? Why be so tight? It's that contracted heart that comes when we're in a fear space. And when we let go and let the divine take the lead, um, which is a wonderful book I recommend to many people by a woman named Toshar Silver called Outrageous Openness, Letting the Divine Take the Lead, Um, then things work out more exquisitely than we planned. So 
planning to live with more joy and more generosity means we're in the flow of abundance because the life stream is perpetually flowing. It's so much larger than we are trying to control um, this energy is impossible, but aligning with it, knowing it is positive, it's that glue close, it is that impulse toward union between cells seeking to happen between humans, and one of the ways we connect with other humans is through language. And so speaking beauty from a loving heart, in my estimation and my experience, is how to enjoy the ride, even when it's a wild one, as it's becoming increasingly so. And the intention is the the uh, rudder for the little boat we um, row merrily as often as possible, trusting that there will be divine support from higher frequencies of energy to assist us in this intention. Would you be willing to read your open heart synchrony poem? When I was writing my fairyography, The Rites of Passion of Philomela Nightingale, I, I wrote quite compulsively, and one was a vision in verse of what will happen when we collectively, creatively upgrade English. And years later, I had a dream in which a very advanced linguist was talking about when we evolve the English language, that the new beings coming in won't forget who they are or what they're doing here. And just to add that when I was writing it, I felt like I was going way over the top, but I couldn't stop. And years later, I met Anne and Whitley Strieber in my neighborhood, and we became friends, and they handed me William Henry's book, The Language of the Birds, and I read in it that my most far-out vision of possibilities was part of ancient mythology, not simply my own fantasy. So I think I mostly know it by heart. I think of how exquisite it will be when we endeavor together to create an enchanted living language of supernatural poetry that scintillates so sensually that everything around us begins to vibrate sympathetically. Our words will ring so true that our honest expressions initiate lyrical sensations that every creature can appreciate since we are all interconnected genetically and electromagnetically. So just as bird songs, cricket choirs, and other natural voices evoke a wholesome rhythm and nourishing harmonic for the planet, our gentle elemental language, every time it is spoke, will resonate syntonically with earth and all upon it. Then, when we give our words, if they can't be broken, we shall spin gold every time they are spoken. This may sound absurd, but let no one scoff it, for when truth be told, it shall make us profit. If this vision vibrates your soul, then let go of concern for the rules for transformational English grammar that have made us all such conversational fools, virtually deafened to the defamations still hidden in the clamor of our incessant ancestral verbal clamor. Instead, dismiss whatever impediments have left you feeling anything less than totally literate and open your heart's mind to the transcendental music of the new angelish language 
and let it endow you with the true sacred spells, affirming terms, amazing phrases that can ring all our bells, lift our spirit, sing God's praises, till our whole communication with the divine in all creation underwrites our liberation and world reconciliation. Let's set tongues wagging around the earth with the possibility of sweetening up English to a true romance language. For if our words so melt the heart, they start the milk of human kindness flowing, so that every time we speak our mind, we set another flower growing then I believe before our very eyes, we human beings, like butterflies, will finally metamorphosize. And as new creatures in the sun who speak the language that's become our mother planet's mother tongue on this first Aquarian millennium, We will talk our way back through the garden gate with words that help reconsecrate this hallowed ground to which we all are bound by fate. For with this potent, superconscious language that our liberated spirits speak and sing in celebration of the union of the highest being with every life form incarnation, we will succeed in gaining back the deed to Eden that will allow us to pass through a door of heaven. And once our hearts have taken wing, there is no telling what the deep soul velvet of our inner beings will bring upon this plane of waking dreams. We only know that with the lyrics to the song of songs that zings throughout creation, we will regreen the meadows of our hearts with sacred psalms and incantations and with poems so rich in spirit pollen, mercy grows where words have fallen. And all of us in faith with trust will clearly hear our own soul calling. And then, do you know what we can call this place? When everybody walks and talks with the wisdom, beauty, mercy, power, and grace of a Buddha or the Christ, paradise. For our joyful noise will have made it possible for us to love and live on the free frequency of a higher octave. That was so beautiful, Laurel. Is there anything else you want to share today about word magic? That, as I shared earlier, this is self-awakening wordplay. That I've made a lot of discoveries But this is an enormous language filled with so many languages. And also every language has, as as, uh, one linguist said, a singular way of making puns. So if you know other languages, look to see what words share the same sound and whether there's a correlation you can find between them, because you will understand in this way the consciousness that's wired up into the culture, cultural mind, as well as higher mind. And you can contribute to blazing the trail to a new word ardor, where we take command of the language and use it for our mutual upliftment. Laurel, thank you for bringing your inspiration to us, your heart, and really giving us a lot to consider when we choose to speak and communicate and how we love and connect with each other. Thank you so much for being with me today. What a pleasure, Emmy. Thank you. Just a delight to play with you. 
And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. 